the chords the way they should be and my tone of voice is sometimes not right. But I'm going to do two songs for you this morning. I asked Pastor Mark if I could have some time and he said, sir. Sure. I don't know how much time it's going to be, Rick. Like, <laughs> Rick <is fine. laughs> the two songs I've chosen I think are appropriate for Easter. The first one is 30 Pieces of Silver. I hope you enjoy it. Here's a sad but true story from the Bible it came. And it tells us how Judas sold a Savior in shame. He planned with the council of high priests that day. Thirty pieces of silver was the price they would pay. Thirty pieces of silver, thirty shekels of shame, was the price paid for Jesus on the cross he was slain. Betrayed and forsaken, unloved and unclean, in anger they pierced him, but he died not in vain. But there on the hillside, the multitude came and found our dear Savior and took him away. They smote and they mocked him, thorns were crowned around his head, and his raiment of purple showed the blood stained of red. Thirty pieces of silver, thirty shekels of shame, was the price paid for Jesus, on the cross he was slain. Betrayed and forsaken, unloved and unclaimed, in anger they pierced him, but he died not in vain. Far off in the mountain, but his face toward the sun, Jesus begged for mercy for what he had done. He gave back the silver for his heart filled with strife. And there on the mountain, he took his own life. Thirty pieces of silver, thirty shackles of shame. Was the price paid for Jesus, on the cross he was slain. Betrayed and forsaken. Unloved and unclaimed, in anger they pierced him, but he died not in vain. In anger they pierced him, but he died not in vain. Also, as Pastor Mark this morning, he's been talking about some things there in the past several weeks and it really got me to think. I know we all celebrate Christmas as the birth of Jesus Christ. But Easter seems to be more important in my heart than what Christmas does. Because what one person did for each and every one of us to allow us to be free from sin. Pastor Mark always refers to it. He was scared that he was going to go to hell. Well, many years ago, in this in this chapel, I've been in this church ever since I was a baby. My mother drug me to church, <laughs> literally sometimes, on Wednesday night. In fact, for those of you that don't know, that back in the early times of this church, the men and the boys sat on this side of the church, and the women and the girls sat on this side of the church. That was a great time for me because I got to sit with the men. I didn't have to sit with my mom. <laughs> And I remember there was a revival here. And it was longer than most of you have been here. I mean, it's like 56 years ago. And for those of you that don't live or didn't live in this community, it wasn't hard to get the word out that there was a revival at Oak Hill Church. 
Because if you lived in this community, the breadwinner of that family either worked at Barrick's line plant or Ligord's line plant. They didn't have a choice. They lived in a company house, and that's where they worked, and word got around. Now remember, Reverend Ernest Baker, we had a revival at this church that year, and it was in March, beginning of March. And Ernie Baker, to me, was like the Billy Graham. He had a way with words that everybody could understand. Whether you were a fifth grade graduate, dropped out, went to work, or you graduated from high school, Ernie Baker came across and everybody understood what he was talking about. And I remember that at that revival, he preached on Sunday night. And back then, this church shared a preacher with, two, with another church at Bark Hill. So our preacher preached here in the morning, he preached at Bark Hill in the evening. If he preached at Bark Hill in the morning, he preached here in the evening. There was no excuse for not going to church. You had that opportunity every day, every Sunday. But I remember Ernie Baker preached the first sermon that of, of revival that week. And I believe on the, on the second night, on Monday night, Reverend Godson was here. Then Tuesday night, I think it was Reverend Easter Day. Then the third night, Wednesday night, well, the fourth night was a gentleman that I don't remember his name, but he preached a sermon and painted a painting while he was preaching right here. <laughs> And I don't know who got that painting, but somebody in the church actually got that painting. And I'd love to know where it's at because it was beautiful when he was done. But it was, it was, it was wonderful. Then Thursday night, Reverend Harold Beck preached. And I'm talking preaching. I'm talking about standing on that pulpit and Bible thumping and telling everybody in this crowd how much of a sinner they are. And I'm saying, wow. Man, I don't want to go to hell. I was so afraid of the devil that I didn't know what to do. And I remember that night I went home. And I asked my mom, Mom, am I old enough to be a Christian? And I'll never forget what she told me. She said, I can't answer that question. But she said, when you say your prayers tonight, ask God, He'll tell you. That sounds like a good answer to me, so. Boy, I couldn't wait till the next night. Sitting right back here where the front of our in that pew. I had to sit with my mom that night because when we got here, the church was so full. There was nights that they had to sit out there. They had to sit out there because the main sanctuary was full. You couldn't get another person into the church. Well, at the end of Reverend Beck's sermon. It was like somebody come back there and grab me underneath the both arms and pick me up out of that pew. I don't even remember coming walking up the aisle. It was like I was floating. And I remember I was crying, but I didn't know why I was crying. But when I got here to the altar, I felt an arm around one shoulder and an arm around the other shoulder, and we knelt down. And I looked, and it was my Uncle Paul on one side and my Uncle Sam on the other. My mother's brother and my father's brother. And they knelt down here with me, and they prayed with me and for me. That night I gave my heart to Christ, and boy, am I ever glad I did. And I stand before you this morning and tell you that there was a time that I did stray away. But boy, when I had this heart attack, Roger just came in at Trout's Market. Before I had my heart attack, Roger said, Barry, why don't you come back to church? I said, I'll think about it, Roger. Well, it was only about two weeks later I had a heart attack. Apparently, I thought about it too long. But those things in my childhood will never, ever, they'll be close to my heart forever. And I don't think I ever shared this with my wife. So I'm sharing it with you this morning because I just felt compelled that <clears throat> this Easter season and it's in March. And I don't know, Sandy, was, was you one of the people that 
gave their life to the Lord that week. That week. No. I mean, there was, I think the baptismal took over two hours. It was that many people. And they had three ministers. And it was in April or March that they baptized us. That they baptized us out at, out at uh, Muddy Run, which is now Cookerley's Creek, to be more politically correct. But Legors had a family cabin. And they had a pool there that they had boards in a dam that you could stick boards in and raise the water level to any level you wanted. And they did that, and that's where we got baptized in Muddy Run. And Rick and Donna's daddy and grandmother each had a cabin out there. And my Uncle Junie Schlatzwell had a cabin out there. And each one of us stood in line to get baptized. And it was cold. They had to break the ice on the edge of the water. Literally. And those three preachers, though, stood in that water that whole time. Us kids and us people that got baptized, we only had to be in there for a few minutes. And once we were baptized, then we'd come out and went up the bank of the creek and went across the hill. And they had my uncle's cabin set up for the boys to change their clothes in and dry off. And they had heat in the cabin. And they had uh, the Stonmars house. Now his cabin set up for the girls to change their clothes. And through all that, in the cold March, cold weather, cold water, not one person that I can remember got as much as a sniffle. And that tells me that, that God works wonders and Jesus is alive. <laughs> now, thank you for letting me share that with you this morning. It's been on my heart all week. I didn't even tell Marianne I was going to give a testimony this morning, but I felt compelled to do it, and I'm glad I did. I, I feel good about it. Now I'm going to sing you one more song, and then I'll turn the service back over to Pastor Mark. And this one is uh, called The Man in the Middle. Three men on the mountain, up on Calvary, and the man in the middle was Jesus. He died for you and me. Well, the man on the left was a sinning man. Tied to the cross he bled. He could have been forgiven, but he mocked the Lord instead. You say you are the Son of God. He nailed you to that tree. Come down, come down and save us, if God your Father be. Three men on the mountain, up on Calvary. And the man in the middle was Jesus. He died for you and me. Man on the right was a sinner too, but he was sorry for his sin. He asked the Lord forgiveness, and Jesus said to him, Fear not, fear not this earthly death. Before this day is o'er, you'll be with me in paradise on heaven's golden shore. The man on the mountain, up on Calvary. And the man in the middle was Jesus, and he died for you and me. And the man in the middle was Jesus, and he died for you and me.